much of what we're seeing right now, which I think is movements in very much the wrong direction, are a reaction, a, a backlash to all the progress that we've made. From Interfaith Alliance, this is The State of Belief. I'm Interfaith Alliance President Reverend Paul Brandeis Rauschenbusch in New York City. I've got an incredible guest to introduce you to. The Honorable Don Beyer represents Virginia's 8th Congressional District in the House. And he's got so many thoughts on religious freedom, the epidemic of hate infecting our country, and the relationship Americans can and should have with their elected officials. I really think you are going to get a lot out of this conversation. We are growing the state of belief, building on our almost 18-year history by partnering with Religion News Service. And as part of the RNS family of podcasts, there's a next generation, the state of belief podcast I want to make sure you are subscribed to. Please visit stateofbelief.com slash new podcast. It would really help us to have you subscribe, rate, and tell people you're close to about all that you're hearing. The State of Belief is made possible in great part by the generous support of our listeners. If you've made a donation, thank you for helping get these conversations heard by more people who need them. If you haven't pitched in yet, information on how you can help keep this show on the air is available at stateofbelief.com. And you can find out more about the work of Interfaith Alliance and join us at interfaithalliance.org. And now to my guest. The Honorable Don Beyer has been representing Virginia's 8th Congressional District since 2015. He previously served two terms as Virginia's lieutenant governor and was chosen by President Barack Obama as ambassador to Switzerland and Liechtenstein in 2009. Representative Beyer is a leader in the fight against hate and bias, including anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, and his important work on religious freedom in partnership with Interfaith Alliance, has encompassed his entire term in Congress. In 2016 and in the following years, he introduced the Freedom of Religion Act, endorsed by Interfaith Alliance, among other leading organizations in response to the Muslim ban and other discriminatory actions threatened by the Trump campaign and administration. And his leadership on the Jabbar Hire No Hate Act of 2021 has created critical resources for the Department of Justice and local law enforcement to fight hate crimes. Representative Beyer is the senior House Democrat on the Joint Economic Committee, serves on the House Ways and Means Committee, and is a member of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, which importantly works to keep religion out of government. Congressman Beyer, thank you for being with us on the State of Belief. Uh, Paul, thank you very much. I was, I was honored to be invited. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Well, you know, you and I made contact with one another a couple years ago before Interfaith Alliance was even a twinkle in my eye um, because I was interested in your grandmother, Clara Mortensen Beyer, who was a phenomenal woman and who also happened to be one of my grandmother's, Elizabeth Brandeis's best friend. Can you tell us about Clara a little bit? Well, well, Paul, it was so much fun to to learn about you and to meet you just because I was raised with stories of my grandmother's friendship with your grandmother and with her Friday set Sunday brunches at your great grandfather's house, Justice Brandeis. And you know, she was a young woman. Um, you know, she had, she didn't marry till 28, which was an old maid. Her family had given up that she would ever get married. Uh, that How terrible. Can uh, you imagine? <laughs> and, and, uh, and I was so blessed because she lived to be 98 and a half. And uh, I, I talked to her almost every day of the last 10 years of her life. It took me a while to realize what a what a gem we had in our family and to reach out and talk to her. But she was an enormous influence on me. She was like one of these women at that era uh, in the in the kind of early uh, 20th century, who was getting out there and really caring about labor, really caring about things that we kind of believe in now, but she she was a pioneer around minimum wage, labor protection, all these things that were so important in creating a better America. Your grandmother, uh, working with Frances Perkins and working with my grandmother, they, they were these kind of radical women who were not afraid to stand up and say, this is what is right. 
No, you're absolutely right. You know, she uh, was the sixth of nine children from Danish immigrants. Morton Mortensen was her father. And living on a farm in Northern California, uh, her dad was killed in an accident. She and her mom went to work as domestics, cleaning ladies in the dorms at Berkeley. Uh, so I think grandmother was uh, was 13 or 14, but she did the old goodwill hunting, the back door. Uh, and only two women graduated from Berkeley in the class of 1915. Uh, Clara with a master's in labor economics. So she went off to teach at Bryn Mawr where she got in trouble because she took those lovely young society ladies downtown to uh, to battle for women's right to vote and early, uh, early suffragists. Uh, and then got to work with your grandmother at, at the D.C. Minimum Wage Board back when the minimum wage was a brand new idea. Yeah, they were the ones who were like going in and, and taking on different uh, organizations saying you have to, you know, you have to. Uh, follow a minimum wage and we're going to determine what that wage is and we're going to make sure you follow it. It was such gutsy work. And then the Supreme Court <laughs> ruled it unconstitutional and like with, with Brandeis having to excuse himself. Uh, and, uh, and boy, there's a lot of history. We could talk about only that, but I just, I think it's important that listeners know, like you come from this stock and I, I can imagine with that kind of, it, for me it too, with that kind of aura, you kind of, you feel like, okay, let's, we, we have something that we have to do with our lives. And I'm sure even <laughs> as you, even as you were lieutenant governor, all these really important pieces, you were looking at your grandmother's legacy and saying, okay, that's part of my work is to continue that great legacy. Uh, 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 absolutely. And it was really interesting, too, from a, a faith and politics standpoint. Um, as near as I could tell, she was she was a nun back when there weren't a lot of nuns. I, mean, I never once heard her say anything religious or spiritual um, or, or I think she went to church just for family members, you know, Weddings and funerals. Um, that was that was all. And yet, the life she lived was so moral, was so committed to all of humanity. Yeah, it's uh, yeah she's an incredible yeah. inspiration. Yeah. yeah, I well, you know, and you know, my grandmother was Jewish, but married uh, the son of Walter Rauschenbusch, a Christian, and they, you know, they they went to Unitarian Church, but. But really, that you know, they never argued about religion. Religion was not a problem for them or for their families. Both members, both sides of the family were thrilled that they were together because of the work they were doing. And I just think that's such a great example of um, religion and democracy and how it does not need to be a detriment. But talk to me a little bit right now about how you view the state of religion and democracy in America. Well... Uh, I, I, they're, I'm sure they're deeply interconnected, but, but let me treat them separately for a minute. Uh, on the, the state of democracy, it's it's quite worrying. Um, and mostly because of Donald Trump. You know, I think that um, much of what we're seeing right now, which I think is movements in very much the wrong direction, are a reaction, a, a backlash to all the progress that we've made. You know, I think it's really important not to forget the progress. For example, the most one of the most obvious ones is uh, I remember when women's lib came to uh, my college in my freshman year, and, every, and all, all of us men just laughed about it. Uh, and now, of course, we just assume, I mean, I do, with my three daughters and my four sisters, you know, that, that women are just as capable or more so than any man that I know. And we certainly see it in the U.S. House right now, the incredible leadership of women. You know, women are dominating our graduate schools, our med schools, our law schools, undergraduates. We have to have affirmative action to get enough men in to balance the classes. Mm. Uh, or, or LGBT. I, I didn't know a single gay person growing up. Well, of course, there were gay people everywhere, but no one was out. I mean, and, and now um, we can have reasonable conversations about trans, which was unheard of even 10 or 12 years ago. But there is a pushback on it. And the pushback gives us the Viktor Orbans of the world and the Putins and the Donald Trumps. Um, mm. We have so many more immigrants in America now, the, or at least immigrants of color. All those Irish and Italians, they were always there. But um, now with the people from the subcontinent, from South America, Latin America, et cetera, uh, it's a different world. And, and in many ways, 
the the threats to democracy are reflected in um, pushing back against uh, changes that have come so quickly that many people just can't have not yet adapted to. Right. On, on the religion standpoint, we we got this world where, as they say, before the advent of science, there were no atheists um, because you had to have a way to explain the world, and now we can explain so much of the world. Uh, you know, in terms of, of math, physics, chemistry, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what we can't explain is the presence of evil in the world. And that's, I think, why um, there's still, well, there's still an enormous need, I think, for, for religion and for spiritual faith. But, you know, the, the percentage of nuns just grows and grows and grows, and especially in my kids' generation. At, at friends' lunch after friends' lunch, we'll, we'll ask the question, do, do any of your kids go to church? And the answer is virtually always no. Mm. Uh, it's become uh, a much more secular country than, than yeah. it's ever before. Not not a less moral one, although some would argue that. But with the <laughs> the explosion of porn, for example. Um, yeah, well, let, let's talk a little bit about the intersection, because one of the things that, of course, we're very concerned about is religion being used as a tool um, to legitimize, you know, bigotry and to legitimize the idea that America is a Christian nation. And by that, they mean kind of white Protestant Christian nation. And um, that's the reason that, um, you know, some of the pushback that you're com- you're t- you were commenting on on our democracy is actually being... Um, kind of upheld and actually uh, inspired by a certain sort of Christian nationalist rhetoric that we're seeing uh, coming through. And unfortunately, they're kind of claiming faith and the flag when actually it's it's neither. Have you have you been I, I mean, I imagine as someone who spends time, <laughs> spends time to put it uh, an understatement in uh, in Congress, you must be seeing th- these kind of this kind of rhetoric. Yeah, we see a lot of it. And the, the challenge always is, on the one hand, respect people's individual religious beliefs, because um, they're going to be varied all over the place, even within my, in, within my own family. I don't think any two of us agree. You have exactly the same understanding um, of, our, of our relationship with God or, or, or nature um, or, or the, you know, a, any kind of identical eschatological beliefs. Um, but, but then turning and saying, what right do we have to impose our spiritual beliefs, our religious beliefs, our dogma on other people? For example, our new speaker, Mike Johnson, I, I've never talked deeply with him about his religious beliefs, but I understand they're very conservative. Um, okay, it's fine. I, th- I think that's great for him and that what works, works for him. But what we'd hate to see is other people's religious beliefs being put into law. The most obvious challenge there is is the right to reproductive freedom to get an abortion which has been lar- largely um, free of religious prohibition for the last 2000 years but the last 100 years it's really started to kick in and um but yet you just look at the the number of women who have chosen to uh, have abortions um and are perfectly morally fine with that and think why does why does one person's religion or sect or personal beliefs get to be imposed on everybody else? Yeah, and that, well, that I, it's the same with with uh, LGBTQ, with trans, with uh, many other different ideas. Yeah. Well, you, and what's interesting is that you know if you if you take religious people as a whole. Uh, something like seventy percent support LGBT equality of religious people. That doesn't include, right, you know, that, right. and seventy percent also include um, some some religious freedoms for abortion and and certainly for contraceptions. And yet you have some people um, mobilizing their faith and saying, you know, this is the faith uh, and c- claiming the mantle of faith and not representing the whole of traditions. One of the things that we're really um, at, very concerned about is the rise of hate in America right now. And, you know, we're seeing incredible um, rise in uh, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia that was happening even before um, October 7th. And now it's just turning into some very 
terrible and violent and even deadly incidences. Are, what, what role does the Congress have uh, in counteracting that rise in hate? Well, the very first part is to be a good example. I mean, as you know, words have power. We need to continue to condemn anti-Semitism in every possible way. And I am uh, generally heartened by the fact that virtually everybody in in Congress and virtually all of our elected officials, not, you know, I'd say 98 or 99 percent condemn anti-Semitism. That would not have been true in the 1930s and 1940s in America. It would have been true in the 50s and 60s. There are an awful lot. I mean, the, the country clubs didn't accept Jews. You know, the, the colleges didn't accept, you know, it, the, there was a, a, while Jewish Americans have been prominent in the, the sciences and the arts, um, in, in academia for a long, long time, they've not been accepted socially except for the last, you know, 30, 40 years. So once again, there, this is, there's some pushback here, but we shouldn't forget how far we have come. Um, the, the, and I think the hate has always been there. The scary part is that there's a lot more violence. And that gets into the complications with 400 million guns on the street, with um, how many violent movies, television shows, video games um, we're around. We are we are surrounded uh, in a very violent culture. Mm. Well, one of the things that um, you were very involved in was the Jabara Hire No Hate Act. Um, why did you choose to become involved with that? Well, it, it was first inspired by after the Muslim husband and wife killed all those people, and I think it was San Bernardino, and there were um, bomb threats and and the like at the local um, Muslim uh, mosque out in Falls Church in my congressional district. So I, I went there to you know, decry those things, and they were talking about all the hate crimes there. So we... And, we put the the bill in just we did the research and found out that even though hate crimes were legislated you know part of the law in most states very few police departments are actually reporting any hate crimes so things that actually were hate crimes were not being report, reported that way and i was in business for 46 years paul and basic business premises you can't manage what you don't measure and then if you measure something you change it you know, almost inevitably and so we, we tried different things. We first tried a stick, which didn't pass. Then we tried a carrot, uh, which didn't pass. And then when COVID came, there was a rise in anti-Asian hate crimes. And that finally gave us enough momentum. The Islamophobia, the anti-Semitism, and now the Asian, hate, Asian American hate crimes to pass the bill in a bipartisan way and put it on, on President Biden's desk. And even now, it's far from perfect. We're, we still have a significant minority of American police stations and departments that they don't report anything. Um, and so we're, you know, we're always working on the next iteration to try, try to make it better. By the way, just reporting is a great first step, but then we put a lot of effort into getting the Department of Justice to say, okay, here's, here's the hate crimes that we see. What can we do to address them? Yeah, so important. And I know that in your district, you have both very prominent, um, you know, Muslim communities as well as Jewish communities and Christians and others. How do you, um, as a their elected official representing them in the government, uh, how are you managing, like personally, to to balance that, you know, that great responsibility um, to all these people who are looking to you for some representation, some voice. For me, the most important part is to be the best listener I can be. You know, generally politicians like to hear themselves speak. <laughs> I'm on the quieter side. Uh, I'd much rather listen. And in, in, in listening and being able to feed back to what you've heard, you make people feel like they're heard. Uh, and, and that makes an, an enormous difference in terms of their, their ability to trust you and to trust the system writ large. Uh, and... And always, always never to be saying things on the evil side or the dividing side. Uh, of the many things that I dislike about uh, Donald Trump, probably the worst is that he's the only president that I can think of in our history who set out to divide us. I mean, George Herbert Walker Bush, 
Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, Obama, Biden, all have made it a priority to try to bring America together again. Uh, none have succeeded, um, but the worst part is having a president who's actively put, pitting one group against another. And for, for us to pit one religion against another was anathema. Yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, the other thing that I've just heard from people who do live in your district is that you, you're a great listener, but you also show up. And you're willing to 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 go to you know to communities, listen to them in their space, be um, present for one another, and that's just feels, you know, it's one thing to say, okay, let's get on a Zoom, but you know, post COVID, to be able to say, okay, I'm going to come and I'm going to like be present with your community. It feels so important in this day again when we have so many divides to physically, when possible, to show up and and. Uh, and that's something that we're trying to do with this, with our, you know, the, the pledge that we're inviting people to sign is um, is show up for one another, commit when even if it's not your community that's under attack, show up for any community that is under attack and be, you know, as much as possible, be there with your heart and spirit and body. Uh, so I just feel so important what you're doing. I just wish there were more time, Paul, because the yeah. even a little congressional district with 785,000 people. Um, there, there's the opportunity to be many, many, many different places at any given time and, and just not the human capacity to do it all. Right, right. Up next, more with Congressman Don Beyer. You can hear full episodes of The State of Belief anytime on our website at stateofbelief.com and make sure you subscribe to the Next Generation podcast at stateofbelief.com slash new podcast. That's stateofbelief.com slash new podcast. You're listening to The State of Belief, where religion and democracy meet. I'm Roxy Stone. And I'm Caitlin Beatty. Stay by the City is a podcast from two Christian women cracking the code of faith from the mean streets of New York City. Our podcast captures what happens when purity culture meets hookup culture, when distraction steals from devotion, and when the diversity of viewpoints and lifestyles clash against assumptions. Gotham can be a weird place for Christian women, but we're out there and we have stories to tell. Stay by the City, wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks, Thanks for, for listening. listening. Uh, tell me a little bit about um, how you bring your personal faith um, and background into your role as a policymaker and leader. You know, we, what we like tried to talk about is healthy boundaries between religion and government, but that doesn't mean restricting any individual from having inspiration uh, or a religious tradition. Of course not. We have many brilliant people on both sides of the aisle, you know, who are inspired by their faith. What's the way you manage that kind of uh, inspiration and um, helping it inspire some of the work that you're doing in Congress? Well, I think it, I think it inspires almost all of it. Yeah, I mentioned at the beginning that my grandmother was a famous nun, or not famous, but she was you know never mentioned God or once in, in my memory. My my mother, on the other hand, um, was a essentially a Catholic convert. And was deeply religious um, and very much racist, not just in going to Mass every Sunday, but but prayer was a big part of her life and then mine too. And uh, you know, I was Jesuit educated in, in high school, uh, which was also really important to me um, just because of the books they made us read. You know, the, the Inebor and Tillich and, and uh, Pierre Tejo de Chardin and others. Um, so I, I find that I try to start every day with, um, actually, my favorite prayer is a Baha'i prayer. It's called the hollow reed prayer. It says, the Lord make me a hollow reed from which the pith of self has been blown, that I may become a pure channel through which your love may flow to others. And that, that the prayer is much longer, but that opening line alone, um, I try to define my daily activity on the hill. You know, to to be uh, as giving as as I can be, which then also, and, and that's in the personal 
relationships, but also very much in terms of the the legislation itself. You know, the, there was a great, I, I, I almost never quote Nietzsche, but there was a great line he would say, but does it serve history? Uh, we look and say, does this legislation do anything to make people's lives better? Um, do, does it advance the, the, you know, if you look at uh, the, the phenomenon of man, you know, the Pierre Thierry de Chardin's classic, you know, it's all from alpha to omega. And the end of history is, is foreshadowed um, by the life of Christ. Um, so now that we're aware that history has a direction, what are we doing to move it along in that direction? Mm. Um, and, and for me, that's, that's, there are many, many different ways to do that. Um, but for me, the, the political action is the, the one I think that I've been called to do. Mm. On a radically different topic, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, your experience on January 6th and the continued echoes. I think, unfortunately, many of us, you know, we've heard the big story, but I think what gets lost is what it felt like to be in the room and what it felt like to be also the sense of what it did to history especially the history of our democracy. Can you talk a little bit about January 6th and, and how it affected you personally and your thinking about where we stand with our democracy? Um, I try not to catastrophize. Uh, mm -hmm. I wasn't in the chamber. I was across the street in one of the House office buildings. Um, I'm not a constitutional scholar, so... Uh, Nancy Pelosi has said, if, if you don't have a speaking role in the House floor, stay in your office. So I did, which just meant that as they, and I listened to the entire Trump speech, which horrified me. Um, but as they were walking up the hill, um, they, uh, the word came to lock all the doors, close the curtains, stay away from the windows, things like that. Um, so I spent, uh, I think it was 17 hours locked in that office. Uh, which is not a big deal. I mean, a tiny sacrifice compared to what the people who had to suffer through the actual attack had. Uh, but I, you know, watching it all on TV and listening to it, uh, the, the notion that it was a relatively small group of humanity, most of the country was in the world was looking at it with horror. Uh, and I didn't, don't believe, didn't believe that that um, represents the American people or, or or, or who we are. Uh, most of the people that got swept up in it, you know, have been, um, you know, punished severely for it um, or, or apologetic. They would never do it again. Uh, you, had, you always had a bunch of hammerheads which probably had too much to drink and were swept up in, in the fervor. And they were fired up by, you know, a cult-like figure, you know, Donald Trump. Um, but I, uh, you know, I, I've read recently that Oh, the the old governor of Arkansas said the next, if Trump doesn't win the next, all elections will be settled with bullets rather than ballots. I don't believe that. Yeah, I still spend an, all the time in the community. I only meet good people across the political spectrum. Um, I'm friends with many, many conservative Republicans in the House who I don't agree with how they would approach immigration or guns or abortion, but they're still good people. You know, they 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 love their families. They, they wouldn't lie to me or try to hurt me. Um, they have different ideas about how to make the world a better place. Um, but I still have a deep faith that our, our, our country's best days lie ahead. Mm, mm. I think that's a, a very helpful uh, perspective. And and I think uh, it, it's, it's just a really important to hear. Um, I, I am curious how you understand like the work that we do, which is to bring different um, groups together to to be effective in um, also you know trying to tell our our representatives what we want as a community. What are what are ways that groups like Interfaith Alliance and other um, advocacy groups can best work with your office and with Congress? What are ways that you can imagine that being a helpful addition to our de democratic process? Well, first of all, let me just emphasize that it is a helpful ad addition, and every little thing we do um, moves us in the right direction. And every hurtful thing we do moves us in the wrong direction. So if you're a force for good out there, 
Uh, I think that makes a difference. By the way, I'm constantly encouraging people who have an issue of any kind to get on the Hill and go meet with their members of Congress or their staff members, which is often more likely to happen. Because when someone comes and talks to me about a, a specific issue, you know, let me, the, the disease ones are easy to identify. Someone comes in and talks to me about type 1 diabetes. You know, it mobilizes the whole team to say, what are the type 1 diabetes bills out there and how do we help and how do we get more money into the NIH budget? And when you come and talk about uh, the need for all religions to coexist, including with the people that have no religion, and how you know generations of religion would drive public policy to be you know to lift up all human beings to be more loving, more kind, more just, more peace oriented, um, that has to affect everybody. Obviously. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I would love to just spend more time with people who disagree with me, <laughs> um, but uh, that's just my personal opinion. Mm. Ah, that's good. Well, I do think that that's really an important lesson. And this is a lesson in democracy is that, you know, I had I had a, a, a colleague you know, say, you know, it, until I started doing some of this work, I didn't realize that you could just go into these buildings you know, and oh, yeah, talk to yeah. people, you know, that, yeah, don't, that you don't, could don't bring a gun. But other than that, <laughs> yeah, they, right. they, they, they don't you even know, ask for your ID. Yeah, it's amazing. You can walk yeah. in and then you can go to these different offices and just say, hey, just want to check in and say, hey, thank you. Or, hey, I didn't really agree with that, but just wanted to let you know my opinion. And it's this is like meant what democracy is meant to be. And I just I think it's um we we do so you know we we do rightly focus on where we're where we're having problems, but I think it's so wonderful to remember that we do have a functioning democracy at this present. It's not perfect, but functioning, and uh, and we can participate. And that's the urge, you know. That's I think the encouragement is to participate. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and most members of Congress will spend a lot of time doing you know town hall meetings in the district that are available. You know, they'll answer most all of their mail. Uh, it's political leaders. It took me a long time, maybe into my adulthood, to realize that political leaders are generally much more available. Not the president, the vice president, but um, virtually at every other level. You want to meet him, just start showing up at the free events. Right. Or write the $25 check and show up at the paid events. Um, <laughs> right. Um, we, we One of the things I'd love to just hear is, like, what's giving you hope right now? Uh, that the, we get so caught up in the day to day and there are always tragedies. There's always a migrant boat that goes down in the Mediterranean or the poor girls that are, that come across the border raped by the coyotes or what's happening in Gaza, you know, the October 7th terrorism I mean, that, that dominates us because as human beings we're always drawn to conflict. Or as my journalist wife says, if it bleeds, it leads. What we miss is that fewer people as a percentage of humanity are going to bed hungry than at any time in history. The number of people that died in violence last year was the lowest as a percentage than at any time in history. That, you know, we have democracies, granted, flawed democracies, uh, but they're all over the world right now. There, there were only a, a handful in the years before. Our lifespans continue to grow um, everywhere. And we're, we're making progress on many, many, many different issues. Yes, uh, we, we face existential challenges like climate change, like artificial intelligence. Um, but we're also trying on that. Not hard enough. Um, I, I still have, have deep faith in, in how all of this is unfolding. Um, which, by the way, I always try to balance, too, with the whole notion that, um, you know, we should store up our treasures in heaven rather than here on earth, um, that at the end of the day, we're all dead, right? Um, hmm. So uh, our job is to try to make this place as much like heaven as we can, realizing we will never succeed perfectly, um, but we just have to do the work day after day, and then also realize that this is our temporary home. Uh, very, very beautiful. Thank you so much. And uh, la last thing I do want to, uh, 
any thoughts on the 2024 year and like what are the ways that we can we can all show up as best we can for our democracy, recognizing that, you know, we're going to disagree, there's going to be political difference and partisan divides, but what is the best way that we can all show up for our democracy in 2024? Paul, the most, very most basic is showing up to vote. In the primaries and the the general election is still so discouraging that many Americans are disconnected, especially young people. Uh, in, In my race this year, coming year 2024, we're going to be almost exclusively focused on the 18 to 30 year olds. You know, our budget's 80% for people 65 plus social security, Medicare, Medicaid, things like that, even interest on the debt, which is largely held by older people. Um, and yet, so we, we're not investing in our young people. And part of the reason is they don't vote the knuckleheads. Um, so <laughs> we're going to try to do everything we can to, to, to motivate them to, to take, control of this democracy and guide our priorities in ways that are better long-term thinking, more investment oriented. You've had a variety of different positions. You've worked as an ambassador. You've worked as a lieutenant governor. You've really actually, uh, you, you haven't run for president yet, I don't think, but maybe that's in the offing. Uh, but, but, you know, you've been in different forms of service. Plus, it's very funny when I met, mentioned your name, people were like, car dealership. And yeah. so you, you've been in the private sector. You've been in all sorts of different ways in public service. Like, it, what is a philosophy that binds all these things together for your, like, your personal mission statement? Do you have anything like that? It seems like you're, you have integrity which is really wonderful to hear. And I, I just would love to hear a little bit more about how you bind all these different roles that you've had together. I think, well, I think the single idea is service. is just taking care of, of people as best you can, making the greatest contribution that I can in, in different ways. I, I've always been attracted to politics, partly, maybe hugely because of my grandmother and growing up in Washington, D.C., where politics is the cottage industry. Um, but also the notion that I heard years ago that at the end of the day, it's the political leaders who decide who has a good job and who doesn't, who has who has food and who doesn't, who has housing, who goes to war, who dies, what our laws are. The whole structure of our, of our society and our economy and our culture is decided by the political decisions that are made. However, I was very fulfilled uh, as a car dealer because... Um, in an industry that wasn't early on famous for its integrity, it's gotten much better. You know, we always felt if we could be honest with every customer, do our damnedest to fix the car right the first time, price things fairly, um, that we could it could be a huge uh, service to the community. Uh, in the meantime, it also, um, my proudest part of that was all the people that came out of college, out of the military, or even, you know, fresh immigrants that got jobs with us and developed in entire careers, they bought homes, educated kids, you know, um, you know be- became um, strong middle class Americans because of the job opportunities that they had. And mm. the, the the best and the reason the business succeeded was because we were and are still as committed to taking care of the customers as we can be is the hug your customer philosophy. You know, I have these three or four wonderful people to do all the consumer complaints that come in to my office, you know, which are Social Security, IRS, things like that. And they are very much just like the service advisors at the Volvo dealership. (laughs) They're very they're trying to understand the concern and then try to figure out how do we fix it? Hmm. I think that's it. Uh, You know, solving problems. I mean, that that, you know, to if I think about our grandmothers, they were. They, they could identify lots of problems, but they didn't stop there. They actually developed mechanisms by which those problems, using the law, using politics, using uh, the academy, whatever levers they could pull to figure out ways to do it better. And I think that's like a, an amazing um, philosophy is, is identifying the challenge, but then also imagining the solution and providing it for the, you know, whether it's for an individual or for the American people writ large. Well, Paul, the different jobs I've had, the leader, leadership roles I've been privileged to have over the years, the one that is most meaningful is the one I have right now. 
um, as a member of Congress, because even though I'm one of 535 and things happen very slowly um, and Senate's drives me crazy with their filibuster and their one person holds, um, you still get to be a change agent. You get to see something that's wrong and try to do something right away, whether it's a, a letter to the president or a phone call with the chief of staff or a piece of legislation, something that that you can pr- try to make m- movement on. And uh, and that's really fun and fulfilling. Yeah, well, I, I, I hope you know that Interfaith Alliance, for for the the issues that we stand for, we are eager to work with you and uh, your colleagues and people on both sides of the aisle to get um, to to make sure that you know our country does represent the widest amount of people it can possibly do, which which should be everybody. Uh, my my last question is: uh, you mentioned that you were doing some sort of uh, conversation at. Christ Church in D.C. about religion and democracy, or do I have that right? Yeah, yeah, it's actually in Alexandria. Oh, uh, in Alexandria, the old okay. historic church, yeah, that uh, both George Washington and Robert E. Lee were both on its vestry, um, wow. although although we had to take down the sign that said that and put it in the library and take it out of the church itself. <laughs> right. Right. Um, so tell me I, about, tell me about like what, why you agreed to do that and what you, you know, what, well, what, what, ins- where that, what you're planning on talking about. Well, they, they invited me. That was the, that was the first piece, um, which is what, why I a- agreed to do it. And, you know, it's been our, our church home for a long time. Although I, again, I'm not not noisy there, um, but it, it, that, that always be. They asked me to sort of lead the discussion on those three Sundays in in January, and uh, so I thought, well, thought for a couple of weeks that so uh, number one, uh, the first Sunday we're going to talk about the separation of church and state. You're trying to find the balance between faith inspired political action. You know, we do these things because you know, of our faith and versus legislating specific religious beliefs. You know, gays are bad. It's banned by the Bible, whatever. Um, the second is choosing among lesser evils. There's a great new book out on, on tragedy in, in public action about how as political leaders, we're constantly being asked to choose between you know, the, the greater of two goods or the lesser of two evils or three or four evils, and, and that there's no right solution. You look at Israel right now. There's, you know, we lots of people calling for ceasefire, others for temporary ceasefires, other, you know, go kill every Hamas member you can. There's no right answer there. That They can't do nothing because Hamas will just come back. And yet they also, you, you hate the thought they're killing 15,000 people, half of them women and children. Um, and then the, the third Sunday is one of the things that bothers me so much is why do good people understand the life of Christ so differently? And this is specifically, it's, I'm talking in an Episcopal church, right? So uh, I don't have to make it uh, universal religion. And because I look at um, the general, the, the U.S. House is, I don't know, three quarters Christian, maybe 60 percent, 65 percent. And so I've got my Republican friends on the other side who uh, would definitely consider themselves Christian. Many of them, you know, born again. And yet their perspective on uh, how you love your neighbor is very different from mine. Um, and, uh, And it would just be a really interesting discussion about um, why we think so differently about these things. For example, Classic case right now is the uh, in, in the budget fight, the, the Republican budget that came out of the House cut funding for Title I programs by 80 percent. Title I programs are for the poorest kids in the poorest schools in America. So this is, you know, basically the extra instructional that they need, the, the, the free lunch, um, sometimes the free breakfast, because that's the maybe the only meal to get that day. And so their perspective, I'm speaking for them, I'm making stuff up, is that um, responsible Christian leadership is making sure that we're taking care of the next generation so we're not bankrupting the government. And it's okay if all these kids, um, you know, that's just the sacrifice they have to make. You know, as Christ said, the poor will always be with us. So, uh, Whereas my perspective 
more comes like these are an, an imminent need an immediate need these kids have been left behind for generations we have the opportunity to to get them through high school to get them to college to get them fed uh and clothed and uh and both of us seemingly are acting on our christian faith uh, and i i think it's a i don't know i think it's a really important discussion yeah it's really important and uh and it's i think one of the things that has been important about you know the the history of interfaith alliance starting in the 90s is um, making sure that just not just one of those sides gets heard uh, as the mantle of faith, but actually that there is a, a healthy debate among religious people on all the issues that are 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 there, and just wanting you know ensuring that no one side says well the religious voice says because that is um, almost always incorrect because if the if religion has one defining uh, characteristic, it's that people don't agree on everything that religion <laughs> says. <laughs> the joke uh, in my tradition is two, uh, two Baptists, three opinions. So uh, I, I, I think that the, uh, you know, but it, it's wonderful. And I, I think that sounds fascinating. That's in Alexandria, Christ Church, Alexandria, and they're, they're lucky to have you. And I think, you know, I, I look forward to, to hearing how that goes. Um the Honorable Don Beyer is serving his fifth term, representing Virginia's 8th Congressional District in the House of Representatives. He previously served two terms as Virginia's lieutenant governor and was chosen by President Barack Obama as ambassador to Switzerland and Liechtenstein in 2009. Representative Beyer is a leader in the fight against hate and bias, including anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, and his important work on religious freedom— has encompassed his entire term in Congress. In 2016 and in the following years, he introduced the Freedom of Religion Act, endorsed by Interfaith Alliance, among other leading organizations in response to the Muslim ban and other discriminatory actions threatened by the Trump campaign and administration. And his leadership on the Jabara Hire No Hate Act of 2021 has created critical resources for the Department of Justice and local law enforcement to fight hate crimes. Representative Beyer is the senior House Democrat on the Joint Economic Committee, serves on the House Ways and Means Committee, and is a member of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, which importantly works to keep religion out of government. Thank you very much for making time to be with us today on The State of Belief. Uh, Paul, thank you. I'm really honored to be included. And I, I love that. I think that both of our grandmothers would be proud that we're trying to do our best to, to keep this world moving forward. And that's all the time we have for The State of Belief this week. Be sure to subscribe to The State of Belief at Apple Podcast or your favorite podcast platform or at stateofbelief.com slash new podcast. We need your help to keep making The State of Belief. Become a partner in this crucial work by making a financial contribution today. Information on how to donate is available at stateofbelief.com. That's stateofbelief.com. And if you're getting something out of the show, and I assume you are, share it with the people in your networks. Let's get more people listening and keep these conversations going on Facebook and Instagram at State of Belief. The views and opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect those of Religion News Service or Religion News Foundation. State of Belief is produced by Ray Kirstein and is a production of Interfaith Alliance. Become a member today at interfaithalliance.org. And be sure to join us next week. I can't wait. Until then, I'm Paul Brandeis Rauschenbusch on the State of Belief, where religion and democracy meet.